Welcome to the Part C Lecture Notebook of Module 3. In this notebook, we will understand what a module is in Python and when and how to import and use it. Along the way, we'll draw some distinctions between the instructions that are Google Colab specific versus what you would do if you had Jupyter and Python installed on your own local computing device. We will also see how to create our own module. I will demonstrate how to use a cloud-based tool that you can integrate with your Google Drive in order to do this. And that's, again, different than how I would recommend doing it on your local computing device. And I'll discuss that a little bit as well. We will implement the differences module to approximate derivatives of functions. Now, I'm only going to focus on a very high level conceptual explanation of derivatives. We're not going to get into all the calculus of how you actually compute derivatives and do it in a closed form. We're just going to approximate derivatives. This file, differences.py, is what it's referring to, is in the GitHub repo for programming for data science. It has three simple functions for using a forward, backward and center difference approximation to a function. And we take the function f as a parameter that's an input to each of these functions, an x value or an array of x values where we want to approximate the derivative of f hat, and then this h parameter that is some sort of control of the accuracy of our derivative approximation. Each function just has one line of code. It's very simple to approximate the derivative, and then we return it. We're just approximating it in different ways, this derivative. So we'll get into that a little bit more within this notebook, but the point of that module is really just to show you an example of a type of scientific module that has useful functions that are very commonly used in all sorts of areas of computational data science. Approximating derivatives are very important for optimization, for instance. And optimization is a really important part of data science as we're often optimating, optimating excuse me, optimizing um, our data science algorithms, our machine learning algorithms, our neural nets, they often have to go through some sort of optimization procedure. And that's related oftentimes to finding where derivative is equal to zero. And that concept will be explored at a very conceptual level in this notebook. We will understand the basic importance of derivatives then in the context of computational data science. And furthermore, we will see how to implement widgets for the first time to add more interactivity to functions. And that's a really cool thing. It allows you to do more visual storytelling within your notebooks and make fancier presentations and just get more out of your understanding of functions by creating a greater interactive experience for the user. So that's the big picture overview of what's in this notebook. It's not a long notebook, but there's a lot of content packed within it. So let's go ahead and get started. What is a module? A module is a file containing Python definitions and statements. The file name is the module name with the suffix .py appended. For instance, I keep talking about this differences dot uh, pi module, I just call it the differences module, but notice it's called differences top pi. Now that you might think that that's a Python script because Python scripts also end with dot pi, but this is not something that's meant to be run where I open a terminal and I say Python and then I give the name of the script to run. This just contains functions and good functionality. It could contain classes, all sorts of other things that are meant to be imported into either a Python script or a Jupyter notebook to be run. And so it's used completely differently than how a Python script is used. It's meant to be something that's imported, just like we import NumPy to use the functionality. But we don't run NumPy as a script that's meant to do anything. It just contains useful functions, methods, data types, that objects that, we're, that we find useful for scientific, and data, uh, scientific computing and data science. So within a module, the module's name is available as the global variable, double underscore name with double underscore. That's not really relevant here. It's just more information than you probably need. Um, and I'll show what that means in a little bit, but you can kind of just ignore that for now. When should you consider using a module? Well, suppose your script or even your notebook gets very long and you want to have easier maintenance. And moreover, suppose you want to reuse a function or some sort of methods in several programs or scripts and you don't want to copy and paste them because if you do that and you say, boy, I'd like to edit that function, I'd like to have some additional functionality. Well, if it's showing up in a bunch of different places, you have to go find all those places to change that functionality. And that just becomes harder to maintain. So what you want to do is just put it in a centralized location, like a module, which is almost like a small library. It's a little bit different than a library, but it's kind of like that. 
And then every time you just change it there, and then when you import it to whatever program you have, you have the most up-to-date version of your function available at your fingertips. So that's kind of the what and when of using a module. And then we're going to have an example. But let's just pause for a second. Make sure you get that differences module and read the next set of instructions about getting that module, reading through some derivatives, and upload that differences.py module into the same folder on Colab as this notebook. And then watch the next part of this video. These next two code cells are only necessary in a Colab environment. If you're running a Jupyter notebook on a local installation on your computer, so you have Jupyter, Python, everything's installed on your own computing device, then as long as your module is in the same directory as your notebook, then you can just run this code cell. You can completely skip. You can just delete those other two code cells. You wouldn't even need to use them at all. And this next code cell should run, assuming that the differences module is in the same directory, the same folder as the notebook, that, as this notebook where you're running this. However, in order to run a module, in order to import a module on Colab, the first thing we have to do is actually mount our Google Drive so that our notebook has access to the contents of our Google Drive where this module is going to be stored. So we first run this code cell. Now this can take a second. I've already run it previously, so it's already been mounted. Um, and that just saves some time because it takes a few seconds because I have a lot of contents in my Google Drive. And if you have a lot of contents, this might take 10 to 30 seconds or so to run just so that it's mounted. And then you will get some sort of mounted uh, output, it will just say things have been mounted. So this, this works. Now, this next code cell is necessary so that we can actually set the path so that the system knows where to look and we're going to insert it at the beginning. That's what this is kind of basically doing for the path that we're going to look for. Where is the path, meaning the directory that is containing this differences.py file? And in order to figure this out, like I didn't type all of this, you can go over here to your files. And then I've already got this open up to where I've structured my within my Colab notebooks in my drive. I have the programming for data science folder, and I'm just mimicking the folder structure that is on this uh, repo, this GitHub repo, which is something I had instructed you to do in a much earlier video in this course. So now what you do is you find the directory. You don't necessarily go to the file, um, although I could show it. You go either here to the directory, the folder that's containing the file. You can right click and you can copy the path. That's what you want is the path variable. So if I copy that path, and just so you see, if I, if I paste this in here, it's not as a string. So let me actually zoom out. If I paste this in here, you'll see that is the, let me, oh, here, let me close that. There we go. This is exactly the same as what I have here in the string variable, but I need to make it a string. So if, if you have a different uh, directory where you've put this, you would have that contents and you would just paste it right here and then make sure to add a tick mark to either side of it. And that's it. You're done. Now it's important again that it's the directory. If you go down to the actual file and you say, we'll copy the path of the file, you're going to see, I'm going to paste this here. It, it ends with the file name as well. And if that's not the path for the file. So if you have that, if you, that's the way you copy the path, you got to delete that part. And then you put this part in around the tick marks to make the string variable you want for the path containing the file. And that's why I recommend just copying the path of the folder containing the file. That's the easiest way to do this. So then if you run this, everything's good. So the, the next code cell, when I run, um, you actually won't get an error. I mean, it's just not, you're not going to know if you did it right or wrong until you run this next code cell. And if I run this next code cell and you see that it runs with no output, there's no error though. This part was done correctly. Now I'll show you what happens if I do it incorrectly. So I'll just go ahead and restart the runtime. So I'll restart and I'll go ahead and I'll just clear all the outputs. So let's say I just go ahead and mount the drive, but it's already been mounted. So this is what will happen. But let's say that I, um, let's say I just got this, I did one more, I, I did this. So it's, that's not lectures, right? Like it had to be within the lectures folder of this folder, the zero three functions loops modules. So this is no longer the right path. I need to go one deeper. I need to go into the lectures folder the way I have it set up. But if I run that and now I try to run this, <coughs> excuse me, 
you'll see that you'll get a module not found error. There's no module name differences. Now, there's basically two reasons that can happen. One, you have the path incorrect, or two, you actually just don't even have the file in there, in which case there is no path for the file that, can, that contains it. So assuming that you have the file, differences.py, saved somewhere on your Google Drive, and again, I recommend putting it the, in the same kind of folder structure that I have, uh, then this shouldn't happen. But if this does happen, make sure that you actually have differences.py uploaded on your Google Drive, and then make sure to copy the path of the folder containing it. And as long as you do that, and then you run this, everything will be fine. You shouldn't see any errors at all. So that is how you mount your drive, get the path, and then import the module. Before we go any further, I think it's a good idea for you to make sure that you have your text editor set up with Google Drive. So what I like to do is go ahead and right click on somewhere in Google Drive, like where your differences.py file is, go to more, and then you can install this text editor. The way I got that text editor installed is I go to connect more apps, and in there you can search for something like text editor in the Google Workspace Marketplace. And if I search for that, I installed this one. So what I had to do when I selected it is I just had to say in install. I then have to give permissions in order to start installing. So I say, okay, install. It starts installing and then it's done. I make the text editor the default app for the files it can open. Okay, done. And so now when I right click on this file and I go to open with, the text editor showing there, instead of being in suggested apps, which is where it will be if it's not installed, I can just open it there. Or if I just go ahead and let's say double click on this, see it's opening this text editor, texteditor.co, and here's the file. And now you can edit the contents, you can view them, do whatever. And if you edit them, like let's say you just add, you know, let's say, you know, this is a useless doc string. Now I, if I, I can save it to the drive. Yeah, I can use hotkeys like Control S or Command S if you're on a Mac, and that will save to the drive. You can download the file. I'm going to ask you to down uh, to make edits or at least make your own module in this notebook as part of an activity. So you'll need to download and submit that .py file as part of your submission on Canvas for the course. Um, or if you're just following along on YouTube, just following this material. If you want to share your .py file, that's a useful way to do it on an email. Although some email services do filter for .py files because they're scripts and they can contain malicious code. So you might have a hard time actually sharing it, in which case you might just want to provide a link to your Google Drive to share the file. But at any rate, there you go. That's how you can now have this text editor ready to go to make changes to a module, either ones I give or ones that you want to create. So if I want to create a new file, I can always just right click somewhere in the open space on Google Drive, go to more, and then just say text editor. It will open up this text editor. I can open a file from my computer, from the Google Drive, or I can create a new text file. And so I recommend if you make up like let's say mymodule.py, go ahead and change the name because then you will get some nice formatting for free, uh, it will automatically start interpreting this as a Python module. So you could have like my function, you know, I'm just doing nonsense here, but you notice that as soon as I even pressed enter, it already formatted this, like it gave it the four spaces that are nice. And then if I was to uh, create like a lit, like it does some autocomplete, like I pressed one square bracket and it created a combination of them. So if I was gonna create a list, um, you know, whatever, I'm just, I'm just doing nonsense here. But that's a good thing to get started. And then it's going to save to drive. You'll have to locate that, but we'll talk about that in a second. Main point of this part of the video, get a text editor app installed. I recommend this very simple, straightforward one associated with your Google Drive account, your Google account, I should say, and that you can then access through uh, your Google Drive, as I was just showing. So just a very quick point, when you save a new file, um, when you save it to Drive, wherever you've created it, notice it will save, as I did here, in the same directory where you elected to right-click and you're creating a new file by going to this text editor and then you're creating the new text file. This is what I did to open up this window in the previous part of this video. And then I made this mymodule.py and I saved it to Drive and you'll see it's saved in here. If I had gone to some other part of my Google Drive, so notice here, and I went to 
more and I went to the text editor and I said create a new text file and it's just this is untitled.txt so let's just say I have untitled.txt and said this is a nonsense file and then I just save to the drive then what happens when I go here is you'll see that there's that nonsense file this, this untitled text and when I open it up you see here this is the nonsense file I just have it open in multiple tabs now which is kind of problematic so I'm just going to kind of close those down and just show you and I'm going to delete this as well because I don't want some nonsense pointless file I'm going to move that to trash we're going to go back here because this is a good tab to have open where you have the differences module and maybe already created a mymodule.py because this will be part of an activity later We are now going to explore how to use the differences module, which is imported as diff, to approximate the derivatives of a function and to compare those approximations to the actual derivative so we get a sense of the approximation error in these various finite difference approximations to the derivative. So here I just have my fun, my function, and it's e to the negative x squared times sine of pi x. This is just a function I chose to create somewhat of an interesting plot so that we have some interesting features to look at when we look at the derivative and its approximations. Now, here's the function that's the actual closed form of the derivative. So this is just obtained using calculus rules. It doesn't really matter how I found this because this calculus isn't a prereq for this class. You don't need to know it. But this is just for a point of reference so that we can actually compare how our approximations are doing. So if, if you don't know how I got this, that doesn't matter. This is just something that's used for illustrative purposes. What you want to pay attention to is that we just use this function to create the approximations to this function. So I'm going to go ahead and run that code cell. So now those functions are defined, so I never have to rerun it to get those functions. I'm going to import NumPy as MP because, of course, we use NumPy all the time. I'm going to create a lin space of x values from 0 to 3. I'm going to create 100 of them. Uh, I like just a little bit of spacing. Sometimes I have some old formatting that I used to have here. I'm going to create a step size h initially of 0.2. So this is kind of a parameter that controls the quality of our approximations. The idea with a derivative is that as h goes to 0, our approximations of the derivative actually converge to the actual derivative. Now that's only true if we're doing computations by hand meaning we're doing things in infinite precision arithmetic, but computers have finite precision arithmetic. So I have some other suggestions that we're going to explore in this part of the video, and we're going to see that there comes a point as we make h very small, as we approach zero, where we will eventually start to see some really terrible approximations, and it's because of the impact of finite precision arithmetic and just round-off error that occurs from that in the code. Now you could say, here's a good question, that a lot of students might ask, if we're taking the limit as h goes to zero, why not just plug in h equals zero to your derivative approximation? Well, if you do that, you can see in each of these approximations, you take the difference of the function values evaluated at x and x plus h, or x and x minus h, or you take the difference at x plus h and x minus h of the function values evaluated there, and you divide by h or 2h. So h is in the denominator which means if you plug in h equals zero, all of your numerators are gonna be zero, all of your denominators are gonna be zero. And zero divided by zero is just not defined. This is just kind of a nonsense thing to do computationally. So you can't just plug in h equals zero, you have to consider taking h to be smaller and smaller as it approaches zero. You have to understand limits. Again, not a big deal other than you need to point, uh, or pay attention, I'm gonna get rid of this useless doctrine by the way. Um, you just need to consider the fact that h can't be zero here. You have to use smaller, smaller values of h, but there's a practical computational limit on a computer about how small you can make h for it to make sense. Whereas when we're doing the type of analysis and derivations that occur in calculus by hand, we can actually conceptualize what it means to take the limit as h goes to zero, assuming infinite precision arithmetic. Well, let's go ahead and run this code cell and move on to the next one. And before I do, I just wanna point out I'm using that differences module just like I use NumPy, right? Like I imported NumPy as np, so I have np.linspace. Linspace is a method, it's a function within NumPy for generating a NumPy array of numbers from 0 to 3, including 0 and 3, that are equally spaced, and I want 100 such numbers. So I've imported the differences module as diff. And so then I have the diff dot four underscore diff back underscore diff, and sent underscore diff. These again are the functions that we see here, for underscore diff, 
fact underscore diff, sent underscore diff. And they require me to give a function f, an x, and an h. And I have them defaulted as scalars, but this is designed to run with NumPy arrays. If I give the x a NumPy array, well, h is meant to be a scalar. x is a NumPy array, h is a scalar, is a number like a 0.1, a 0.2. Its default is a 0.1. I'm running it with 0.2 initially because I set h to be 0.2 here. And that way I can just pass h here without having to set it in all the places. I create a variable h that's 0.2. And now I'm just using positional arguments here inside these functions. But I have diff dot forward underscore diff, diff dot back underscore diff, diff back sent underscore diff. And this will create my derivative approximations. Now derivatives are often denoted by primes. Like if we call a function f, we might say f prime is the derivative. So I'm just using some variable names like f prime underscore fd underscore bd and underscore cd for the forward difference, backward difference, and centered difference approximations of the derivative f prime uh, with all of those different methods. So let's just go ahead and run that code. So that's enough talking, I think. So that's it. It ran very fast. We have these derivative approximations at all of these x values now. And now I'm going to create a figure, a rather large figure, and I'm going to add some subplots to it. I'm going to add three subplots. I'm going to create a two by two arrays, but I'm going to leave one of them blank. In the first subplot, this will be in the first position of the two by two array, so the top left, I'm actually going to plot the function evaluated at all the x values. I am then going to plot the derivative and all of the derivative approximations underneath that function in the next set of axes, well, in what I call axes two, but it's in the third position, so the way it counts in the two by two array is that will be the first one in the second row. And then I'm gonna show the errors in those approximations by actually looking at the uh, different approximations minus the actual derivative function evaluated at all the x values. So that's going to give me the error in all the approximations. And then I'm going to create a legend because I'm labeling each of these plots. Uh, and then I'm just saying plot a legend. I'm saying what the font size is. And then one of the things I'm also showing here is I'm creating a horizontal line that's meant to mimic an x-axis. And I'm going to do that to give you some important takeaways about what derivatives are. But I'll talk about that in the next part of the video. So let's go ahead and run this and just observe the, the outputs. So it just takes a second. So there you go. So here's this function, f of x, in the top left plot. And so it has this kind of nice curve to it. And if I look at the derivatives, you can see that they're kind of all following the same pattern, but the approximations are a little bit off. And f prime is plotted in blue. And then in orange, green, and red, I have these different approximations. And you can see that they all have some error in them. And I plot that error on the right and you can see wow there is some kind of larger errors with the forward and backward difference approximations plotted in blue and orange and then in green i have the center difference approximation which seems to be the most accurate in fact it is it's a second order accurate as opposed to first order accurate which just means it's more accurate so as far as this goes let's start playing around with some h values here let's go back up to this and let's make h.1 which is also the default value so if i run that then you see all of these errors, they shrink. Uh, you have to pay attention to the y-axis because the plots generally look the same, but you can tell from this one that the derivatives have definitely improved in terms of their approximations. And here we have negative 0.4 to 0.4 as the what appear to be the tick marks on the y-axis. And I think they went from about negative 1 to 1 on the previous uh, set of h. In fact, we can just redo it to check. If I go 0.2 again and I run this, yeah, it was like negative 1 to 1. So we see that the error has been made smaller by going to 0.1. So you might say, well, what about 0.01? That should be even better. And if we go to 0.01, if you look over here, they all look like the curves are all on top of each other. And if we look over here, notice the, the plots always kind of look similar, except we see that the y limits are shrinking. This is now negative 0.04, 0.04. So it's a whole order of magnitude better. And we can keep going small, smaller, and I'll just go ahead and do h, let's say 10 to the negative seven, so one e negative seven. And if I run that, and we look at this, we say, oh, look at the, the y-axis. You might say, oh, it looks like negative four to four. You have to pay attention to this number up here, one e negative seven. That's often where if there's a big magnitude change, um, that's where it gets displayed in Matplotlib uh, is, is up here. So I know that can seem a little confusing, but that's the scale for these numbers. Because if they put it, if it put it here, then the numbers would be maybe too far off and it wouldn't display right if you exported the figure. They could get truncated, cut off. So for the spacing between figures in an array, 
they will often put this number up here. So it's just something to be aware of. But it's been made very small, so that it's, again, very, very accurate. All these plots are on top of each other. And you could also play with the line styles of these different plots. Like, this could be the solid line, then you can make this dotted, dashed, and dash dotted if you wanted for the different plots, just to give different line styles. That's totally fine. Um, it's up to you how you want to do that. But, okay, let's keep going. So what about 1e negative 12? So 10 to the negative 12. So now, all right, the error is not 10 to the negative seventh anymore. This is, the error has gotten larger and you're looking at this and you go, my goodness, I mean, these, these plots still look good over here on the left, but the errors, it's actually the errors are starting to get a little worse. It's just to the naked eye, when we look at this scale, negative two to three, it's hard to pick up errors that are on the order of 0 0.00015. But the errors are definitely worse with an H of 10 to the negative 12th than it was with 10 to the negative seventh. And what happens is we keep shrinking h. Well, let's say we go to 10 to the negative 15th. We run that. Now the errors are getting worse. And you actually start to see in this plot, there's some roughness that you see in the figure. You start to see a little bit of the curves not quite matching and looking a little rough because we're getting errors on the order of 0.15 now. So this is starting to get kind of bad. I mean, it's still better than our original h, but the errors are rough. They're not smooth. It's not looking so great. Just keep going. Let's say we go 10 to the negative uh, 20th. Okay, so here's our error in our approximations. You can just see they're actually all on top of each other. And if you look here, all the curves are lying on top of each other. They're just garbage. Um, everything's approximately zero at this point. It's just nonsense. It's just complete and total nonsense. It just has some value going on right here at three. That's okay. Everywhere else, it looks awful. It just, it's just not even applying anything, it just says zero. And it's just the error is basically the, error, the difference between the actual derivative and zero. So it's just the plot of that function reversed because I was taking these derivatives minus f prime to create this plot. So it's just nonsense, right? Like I'm not even getting approximations now, I'm just getting crap. So we don't like that. Um, and you can play around with some other values like 10 to the negative 18th. I think this still produces something kind of interesting. Nope, that's still also just crap. And I think maybe 10 to the, let's go 10 to the negative 16th. What does that look like? Yeah, that's pretty bad. That's a fun one. Look at that. This just looks awful. Um, it was kind of following the function, and then it just became non, like just zero over here. All the approximations are just zero, so it just looks awful. So it's a little fun to play with. You start to see that there's some real issues. Um, and I, I want to just point this out and just emphasize this. I know this part of the video is going on a little long, but one of the great things that this is illustrating are the practical limits of a computer. Notice I'm not getting errors anywhere. I'm not even getting warnings. I'm just getting outputs. And I'm getting outputs with no warnings, no errors, but the code at some point, the outputs of it are completely meaningless. They make no sense. And you have to have this in your mind that when you're dealing with really, really small numbers or numbers with completely different orders of magnitude, there's some practical limits with computations uh, in terms of the ability to produce accurate results. And if you're not aware of that and you just trust that the computer is going to output errors or warnings when there's issues, you can definitely be led astray and trust results when you should not. So there's real value in taking a class like calculus and understanding the difference between kind of an exact answer that you have to get maybe symbolically through some pen and paper work, working things out for yourself and understanding the rules versus what you can get with kind of quick and dirty approximations on a computer, but that your approximations have a practical limit on how accurate they can become because of the practical limits of computation and finite precision arithmetic and round off error that you're going to encounter when you start relying solely on a computer to do approximations. This isn't to say that you shouldn't use derivative approximations or you shouldn't use computations. Of course you should, they're incredibly powerful but you need to be aware of these limits. So this is all just to say, this is kind of like a shameless plug for more math classes. Really take your calculus classes seriously and take a class on numerical analysis because that's a class where you really start to understand the impact of finite precision arithmetic and errors on real methods, uh, algorithms that are used in computational and data science. So. That's it for this part of the uh, lecture. I'm going to just go ahead and make h back to, let's say, 0.1, because I think that's good enough. And then we will continue on with this lecture notebook. But as far as just discussing kind of the practical limits of some of the things we're seeing, 
Um, that's all that I'm going to say for now. Here are some important questions and answers and takeaways about derivatives before we go on. Do you need to know how to compute derivatives in this class? Absolutely not. You can just use the differences module, and we will come back to using it in module four. The conceptual, the, excuse me, the conceptual and computational aspects of derivatives are briefly discussed in this video. I was just discussing um, some of the ideas earlier. Again, a derivative is just meant to provide a linear approximation to a function, and that's a really useful thing. Um, why do we care about the derivative of a function? The derivative gives us very important information about the function. And you can, again, read a lot about the derivative on Wikipedia. I can recommend you do if you're unfamiliar with the concept at all. And you should, at a minimum, watch this video, hopefully. So if you're listening to me, you're already doing a great job. Listen, listen to this video, watch this video. For the purposes of this, of, of this class, we are more interested simply in the applications of derivatives. And here's another link for you to follow to read about that. What is an important application that we care about? Briefly put, optimization. Where a derivative is equal to zero corresponds to what is called a critical point of the function. In other words, the roots of a derivative are critical points of the original function. We are going to study root finding techniques as the first computational application in module four. And root finding is very important for optimization because the roots of derivatives correspond to where a function is has a maxima or a minima. These are the potential locations, at least. These points are of great interest in many computational data science problems as we seek to either optimize our machine learning data science methods or optimize whatever the um, model is that we're studying in a computational science application. So let's re-examine the previous example with these points. So here's point one. We do not need to know the actual derivative, right? So I have three points here. Point one, we do not need to know how to compute derivatives. We do not need to know. We can simply use the differences model. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating my own user-defined function that's relying on the differences module imported as diff to compute the three different types of derivative approximations. I'm using an if, else if, else statement. So this is involving things from a previous lecture where I have this new defaulted parameter, which approximation do you want to make? And you give it a string. Uh, CD for center difference, because that's the most accurate one. FD for forward difference. Otherwise, you must have meant you want the backward difference approximation. And that's it. So this allows me to just use any of the three by just calling this and then just changing a keyword here, just changing this parameter. And then you give it the function f, x, and then I defaulted h to be 0 0.01 because when it was 0 0.01, we got pretty accurate approximations without any issues with round off error. And I think that's what I, oh, I had this as 0.1, but let's go ahead and do 0 0.01 because when we ran that one, I think we saw, yeah, like they really, they all look like the same function. So I thought that that was a good default value for this. Now, the second and third points I make, where the derivative is zero is where the function achieves its maxima or minima. Not necessarily, but at least where it, the function uh, potentially achieves its maximum or minimum, minima. Pay attention to where the derivative curve crosses the x-axis and where the maxima or minima of the function is. So in this uh, figure, I'm showing you a new thing as well. I'm creating a figure. I'm creating that same x vertical in space. It's the, I have 200 points now. I think I had 100 before. I'm, I'm going to, on this subplots, right, I'm using plot plt.subplots to go ahead and create my first set of axes. This is important. I then on my first set of axes on, in this figure, I'm going to plot the function. And I'm gonna, excuse me, plot it in blue. And I'm gonna set the Y label as F of X in blue. I am then gonna create a twin set of axes. This is gonna make it so I can plot on the same figure, but with a new set of axes. And what they're doing is they're sharing the X values. So this is twin X, but I'm, I'm changing what the Y values are. I'm doing that because the range of values for the, the range of the function values can vary quite dramatically between a function and its derivative. So for instance, if we come up here, it doesn't look, you know, it's not too bad, but the function values ranged from about, you know, a little, a little under zero to just under one, but we went from negative two to three. So if we were to plot these on the same set of axes with the same y axis, 
then this figure, this plot would kind of dominate. This one would really get shrunk down because 0 to 0 0.8, it would be only up to about here if we were to draw them on the same set of axes. So what I'm trying to do is plot them so that I want to see on the second set of axes where the x-axis is. I want to set where my derivative approximation is on the second set of y-axis so that they're basically, those y-values are shown on the right-hand side of the plot. And I can then see where it's equal to zero and just everything's going to scale a lot better. So I'm just going to go ahead and show this rather than do too much talking here. Oh, you know what? What helps is if you run this code cell. There we go. Now I run it. And here you go. So with that twin set of axes, the, the values on the left-hand side over here are corresponding to the function f of x. The values on the right-hand side are corresponding to the derivative values, the derivative of the finite difference approximation of f prime. So that's all that I've done here. If I didn't do this, right, if I just plotted everything on the same axis, then it would use the larger ones that are necessary. So it would be like from negative 2 to 3. And that would just kind of swamp out the details that we're trying to see in f of x. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, one of the things you see is where this derivative passes zero. And notice this horizontal x axis that I've kind of plotted as a black dotted curve. That was created on the second set of axes. And this is a typical x axis. It's where zero occurs for the derivative. Notice that zero over here is not lining up with where zero is over here. It's a, they're sharing the x axis, but they have different y axes. But what I can see from that is where this crosses zero appears to be where the function, so where the derivative in red is crossing zero, is where the function appears to have a maximum. And where the derivative seems to be zero over here is where the function has a minimum. And it looks like it only has this one max, this one min, and that's where this the derivative is equal to zero. So where the derivative is equal to zero, if I could find those roots, meaning where it's equal to zero, then I would be finding places where I could optimize the function. Basically, locally, I'm trying to maximize or minimize the function, which could have important applications. So here's another example with a problem. I'm using a sine function, sine of 2 pi x. I'm plotting it over a range where it has several um, maxes and mins. I'm doing the same thing with these. Um, this axis 2 being a twin uh, Ax, it's sharing that x, excuse me, x axis, and I'm going to plot the derivative approximation and the the y axis on the right hand side for that is shown. And just if I make go ahead and make this plot, here you go. So again, notice this: I go from negative one to one here, and I go from negative six to six. So the the difference between the y values is getting quite large, but it makes them look like the same scale when I plot them this way. And again, it's just very easy for doing a visual comparison of where the derivative is equal to zero and where the function achieves its maxes and mins. And you can again see in the, where the blue curve seems to be max or min is where the red curve appears to be crossing zero. So again, the roots of the derivative are very useful, very important for us finding where we can optimize, where we can find maxima and minima of the original function. So that's, again, very useful. And you can play around with this. If you want to make the derivative scale even larger, I can make this like, uh, let's do something kind of, uh, well, not two nuts. Let's say 5 times pi x. And then let's just go ahead and make more points just to make the plot smoother. So we'll do like 1,000. And if I go ahead and plot this just so it's smoother, it looks kind of nuts. But notice negative 1 to 1 here. And it's going negative 15 to 15 on the right-hand side. So that's a bit, that starts to be a big difference. And of course, if you went even larger, let's say I made this like 25 times pi x, and then let's just go 0 to 1 um, there just for simplicity, So I don't because it's still just going to be growing. I, the negative 1 to 1 is always what's going to happen on the left because the function is sine. Sine of 20 pi x doesn't matter. It doesn't change the amplitude. But when I take the derivative, there's a rule called the chain rule, and that 25 pi starts to become a coefficient of the derivative due to something called the chain rule. If you're not familiar with it, you can look it up. It doesn't really matter, but the point is, as I increase the frequency of the oscillations, I'm actually going to increase the amplitude of the derivative. And you can see that that just amplitude grows and grows and grows. And if I was to plot these on the same y-axis, basically from negative 60 to 60, that blue curve would almost look like a constant. It would just look like there was no variation at all. And of course, there's a lot of oscillations, so it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. So I don't recommend necessarily doing this, just giving you some insight into, again, why I like having the twin set of axes when I'm trying to plot a function and its derivative on the same figure. I think it gives you a lot more information. It's a lot easier to tell what's going on with the derivative and its relationship to the function. Another useful point, by the way, 
if we just kind of zoom in, look where the blue curve is increasing. You'll notice that the derivative is positive. And as the function starts to decrease, even though the function's positive here, it's decreasing. Well, it was zero at, excuse me, the derivative is zero at the maximum. And as the function starts to de decrease, the derivative is negative. And then the derivative is still negative because this function's decreasing and it has its minimum, that's where the derivative is zero. Now the function's increasing again, the original function in blue, and that's where the derivative is positive. So there's also this information that a derivative gives you about where a function is increasing or decreasing based on the sign of the derivative, the S-I-G-N sign, whether it's positive or negative, and where it's zero again, max is a min. So derivatives really useful. They give you a lot of conceptual information about what's going on with the function. And so they're a very useful tool in all sorts of computational data science applications. Before we conclude the first video uh, for this notebook, there are two videos. We're going to provide some more details about modules, especially if you're going to be running them in a local installation of Python on your computer as opposed to in Google Colab, and also what happens when you make changes to a module and how you have to re-import it because once it's been imported, you need to actually reload it or restart the kernel in order the runtime uh, in order to have the changes reflected. So there's some options there. And then I'm also for simplicity, um, I'm going to provide the solutions to this first activity within this video at the very end rather than have a separate video for it. And that will conclude this first part of the video, uh, or the, excuse me, this first video for this lecture notebook. There's another video that discusses widgets uh, that we'll get to in a bit, but that'll be a completely separate video. So first, back to details about modules. Where does a module file need to go? Say you were trying to import a module called spam. When imported, the interpreter, when you do this, this is important, it's interpreting, what are you trying to do? It searches for spam in the locations in the following order. First, it's looking for a built-in module or library with that name. It's like, okay, is this something installed that I can install? Like, is it NumPy? Is it something like that? Then, saying it's, suppose it's not, spam.py should be in a list of directories given by the path variable that's something in your system, your system path variable. So the directory containing the input script. So if you're on your local computer and you have your module in the same folder as your notebook or your other Python scripts, wherever you're running this, when you run to this import command from those Python scripts or from your Jupyter notebooks, whatever you're doing on a local machine, it will look to install it from there. Otherwise, it's going to look for this Python path or if you've set your system path based on something like we showed above in this notebook, where you actually are explicitly saying, look here first, right? And that's what's going on when we set, I'm just gonna scroll up here. Um, when we insert this at zero, that's like the first position. We want it to look in this first before it looks anywhere else for the module that we have. So if you do something like that, that'll be the first place it looks if you have some instructions like that about where the path is. But you can also on a local machine set what's called a Python path, which is a list of directory names for in the Python interpreter to go look for where these things are. And then of course, there's like the installation dependent default, which is what happens when you install, like if you use the Anaconda Python uh, package manager to install everything, it's gonna have its own default location for looking at things. So it's gonna look for these things in that order. That's just something that's useful to know, but generally for modules, you would have them in the same location as the files that are calling them. However, if you're using that module in a lot of other places, it's not unusual for you to just put it in one location and then actually just set the path. Like that way you always have the path pointing to it um, instead of having to change uh, the, you know, put that information in all of your scripts, you'll actually just change your Python path to point to it. But that's when you get to a little bit more advanced programming than what we're doing in this class. So the other important thing to pay attention to or to, to just be aware of is what happens when you make changes to a module. So if you find you need to edit a function, for instance, if I'm asking you to, or you add a new function or you just make any changes at all to a module that you want to have reflected in your notebook, then you need to do one of the following. Restart the kernel, i.e. the runtime, and rerun all the code cells. That can be kind of annoying um, if you're really just working on a small part of your notebook. So Another option is to import the library import lib as follows, import, import lib. And then you can run import lib.reload 
blah, where blah is whatever name your imported module, whatever name you imported your module as. At, for example, if you make changes to the differences.py module that we imported as diff above, then you would simply run importlib.reload diff. This is after you've imported importlib. And then now that differences module imported as diff, that will be reloaded with the changes in there. This is really important to remember. I highly recommend, uh, I don't know if there's a way to bookmark this part of the video, write this down, make a note of this. This is a really important thing. It saves you a lot of time when you're incrementally making changes and edits to a module and you want them reflected in the notebook and you don't want to restart the kernel every time and run everything. Cause that just takes needless amounts of time to uh, get your different, your edits reflected in the imported module. So that's it for this part of the video. I'm then going to discuss this activity and its solutions next for those that are interested. Although again, I, I highly recommend really pausing a video and doing this activity on your own first and then watching the video. Welcome to this final part of the video where I go over the activity instructions and the solutions kind of all in one. Again, I recommend pausing this video if you haven't tried this activity yet yourself. Read the instructions, I try to go through it, but there actually are some tricky parts that might require you to watch this video, at least in stages and then pause and try to complete it from there and so on. So the first thing I ask you to do is use this text editor to create a new text file called mymodule.py. Now I did that in an earlier part of the video. Um, I have this file here and I've already copy and pasted the myfun1 from the 03 lecture part A notebook. So I have that opened up here because I just went to where I have all these lectures stored on my Google Drive. I have the mymodule.py saved and I opened up this notebook. Now I do want to emphasize there was an issue I had after I installed the text editor app, which is something I discussed in the very first part of, or one of the first parts of this video you're watching now, where when I went to click on the notebook, it tried to open it up in the text editor because when I installed that text editor, I said, sure, make the text editor the default app to open up files that it can open. Well, apparently it can open up a notebook. And I, the way I fixed it was I had to go to settings and manage apps and I had to go down here and say, don't use the text editor by default, it was checked. So if I recheck this, which is the, kind of the default behavior when you say, sure, use it as the default. And if I go to open up a notebook, you'll see it tries to open it up in the text editor. Well, it does. And it's just nonsense, right? It's trying to read a, a Jupyter notebook. And it's just not designed to do that in a meaningful way. So it just looks like garbage. So you don't want that. So what you have to do is you can you can leave it as the option. You can right click here and go open with and then select Google Colab. But we're going to work with notebooks far more than we are with the modules. So I want the default behavior to be I double click on a notebook file and it opens up a notebook. That's what I want to have happen in the Google Drive. So I, again, I go to settings here. I go to manage apps. I go to the bottom and I deselect the use by default option on text editor. I want to make sure it's not selected. So now when I double click on a notebook, you'll see it opens up in Colab. Of course, I already have it open up in a tab, so it's all good. Now, when you do that, so it's not used by default, if I go to open up something like my module um, and I open it up, it's just, it just tries to open up a preview. I actually don't know why it's not showing the contents because I did uh, save the contents here. So I think it just hasn't been refreshed here yet. I think if I refresh this, and now if I double click, it should show those contents inside. All right, well, it's not showing them yet. That's interesting. Certainly if I open up the differences, you see it has some preview. The point being, either way, you, you can get a preview and maybe the preview of it's not working, but you have the option to select open with text editor here. You can click this and that will then open it with the text editor. Of course, I already have the differences in my module open up in other tabs. So I'll just close that. Uh, similar here, even though I click it, it's not viewing right, but I can open it with text editor and then it opens up the contents and, um, well, I guess in this case, it's opening up a blank one. That's interesting because I have it definitely here with these contents already in there. So interesting. I think it's just like some sort of conflicting copy yet, uh, in that. So you can also right click and just say open with the text editor if you don't want to go through the preview option and then open it up. But all right. So I have my fun one. I have this, I have this in here. I've copy and pasted it. This is part of the instructions now. So back to this. I want to copy and paste my fun one and my fun two from the notebook, uh, the, the lecture part A uh, notebook for module three. I want to put these into that module that I've already saved as a .py file. 
So you see I have, let's go back to my module uh, .py, I already have this saved here. And I believe then if I've imported this, let's look at, I've, I've imported it, import my module as my mod. Now I don't have the MyFun2 in there. Um, I just have, in fact, this, yeah, this is my fun, excuse me, my fun one. I haven't put my fun two yet, my fun two. So if I look at the my mod and I do the dot, right, it should actually, so I think maybe it's completely blank. Maybe that one, this might be saving elsewhere. So I think I might have saved this somewhere else. I'm going to go ahead and just open this up in the text editor, open up in the text editor, and I'm going to put those that my fun there. I'm going to save it to the drive. Okay, now it's saved. Well, this is perfect, actually, because this is going to go to what I want to illustrate in this part of the video. If I go to rerun this, this module, I import, you say, well, that my, my, my fun one is there. My, or excuse, my, my fun uh, one, I believe. Let me just look again. My fun one, yeah. My fun one. And the way that we run my fun one, when I look at it, is I need to give it an X and Y value, let's say like two and three. Right, but I run it, and you'll say it has no attribute. I mean, it's looking for a method attribute here, so I get an attribute error. There's no mod. Um, the module, my module, has no attribute. And you say, what do you mean? It's right here. It's my fun one. So what's going on here? Once you've imported a module, and you go and make changes, and you go, oh, I want to run the import again. It doesn't import it. It's already been imported. So it's not going to update it. In order to do that, you have to follow these instructions. You need to import import lib. So I'm just going to do that here so you can kind of see how it works. I want to import the import lib, the library, the import library. And I can I can run this all day. It's not going to change anything. It's still not going to run. What I need to have is when I make changes to my mod, I need to reload the module. So I'm going to use from the import library, import lib, I need to reload, and I need to reload my mod. You give it the name that you imported it as. So if I import, if I do that now, right, it's been re-imported, and so now when I run this, now it runs. Now you see my fun one is there. It has that attribute. And if I go to this part A notebook, and I go down to, let's say, my fun two, here's my fun two, where I had the defaulted Y value, that was the only difference. So I come back to the text editor and I add my fun two here and I save it, right? So it's very important. I save it and I come back and I say, look, just because I saved it and I go to my fun two and I don't have to give a Y, I just try to run this, but you'll see I have no attribute my fun two. And if you were to just try to run the import my module as my mod again, I'm not going to run this cell yet. And I run this, it still has no attribute. I don't have to rerun this ever again once I've run it. What I need to do is reload the module. So I reload the module. I can of course rerun that cell. My fun one was already there, but now my fun two is present. So now you see I have this output of negative two. Why is it negative two? Well, the Y value is two. All right, so it's running this other part of the code here. Um, so it wasn't the same thing. If I want, if you can check that, it, certainly if I give it three, I don't have to, then it runs at eight. Because it was just the same function, but with the Y defaulted to two. And here I just was running with three. So that's kind of it. That gives you a good sense of the workflow when you're editing a module inside of a notebook, especially in a co-lab environment or on a Jupyter notebook or a Jupyter lab environment on your local computer. And if you're editing your module, it doesn't, you, you import it once, but then as you start making edits, as you're in, you know incrementally improving and playing around and fixing things or adding functionality, you just want to make sure you have the import import lib somewhere. And then you just want to be reloading the module as you're editing it. And then once you're done, once you have it in the set, you know, set as you like it in your module, you can delete this and this, like the, the import lib and the reload stuff from your notebook altogether. Once your module is in the final state you want it, you only ever just need to import it after that. But if you're in an active state of development, especially in this class, when you're working with activities, your own summary activities, or just experimenting with things, 
you probably want to have import lib imported and just work on reloading things as you're editing your module. Because the other option is to restart your runtime, your kernel, every time and run through the whole notebook again, which is just kind of a pain in the butt. You don't want to do that over and over. So this is really the workflow I recommend. Um, you know, get that import lib in, uh, imported and then use the reload command. And this activity is a perfect example of where you might incrementally add these functions and then check that it works. So I've really shown you how to do one and two. And then for three, what I just want to make sure you do is go to this lecture notebook and then just copy and paste some of these uses of MyFun2, which is down below, and MyFun1, which is right here. Just put some of that in here just to show that you can use that function. And again, you're not using MyFun1 and MyFun2 as their own functions, right? The difference in the Part A lecture notebook was these are functions defined in the notebook, the namespace that we're working in here. They're only accessible here in the module. So you have to use that dot convention, my mod dot my fun, my fun, mod dot my fun two. Now you could, if you wanted to have my fun one and my fun two, and you didn't want to use the my mod part, remember the ways in which we can import things. You could from my module import my fun one as my fun one. So if you did that, now that function my fun one is available just as my fun one. You don't have to use the dot convention because I've imported that function from the module as its own name. You you also like don't have to do that part because I'm I'm not renaming it. Um, you know I could just do uh, you know my fun two like this, and then that should just be accessible as my fun two. But maybe you know I just want to call it f two. Like I, I import them as F1, my fun one is F1 and my fun two is F2. And then I could just have like F2 be the, the function that I evaluate there. I'm just giving you some options of workflow, but what I'm actually asking in this instruction is use my mod dot my fun one and my mod dot my fun two. Cause that's a more typical way that you import a module as a nickname and as some variable. And then you just use the dot convention to access everything. That's how I typically do it. But I, I can definitely see cases where you just say, I just want this one function from it. I don't want the whole module because maybe your model's got like a thousand functions that you've defined that are useful and you know you only want one two, you know, one or two or three of them. You're going to save memory. It's going to be more efficient if you just import the specific things you need using the from command. That's not really one of these cases here, so I wouldn't worry about doing it. But again, it's kind of up to you when you do your own things, just as far as these instructions go. Please use my mod dot my fun one, my mod dot my fun two to do the same types of commands that we saw here, where you're running like these, except instead of just my fun one, it's my mod dot my fun one. And down here, you're copying and pasting these over, but again, instead of my fun two, it's my mod dot my fun two. So that's it. Um, that concludes this first video. The next video in this uh, lecture notebook will cover widgets.